Digital Network Director for Witty Los Angeles. On my day job, I work as a technical recruiter at Johnson Service Group, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about um, what we can do once we leave the conference today. So um, how many of you are enjoying the conference? Please shout it out. I want to hear it. Woo! Right? And are you getting value information? Are you taking away um, good content? And do you want to keep that going in your communities? Yeah. You want to take the enthusiasm that you're feeling right now and bring it home with you, right? Yeah. OK. Well, you can, OK? So we, as the network directors and the regional networks, help bring your witty, witty to your communities via the witty regional networks. We have networks all over the United States and internationally. And our latest networks are in New York City, Chicago, Minneapolis, Toronto, and Pittsburgh, just to name a few. We also have regional networks in LA, Irvine, here in San Jose, San Francisco, Atlanta. Um, so there are regional networks everywhere. And if you don't have a regional network where you are, then you can help create one. So in LA, we've had some really great events over the last, like, Two years or so, we've had cybersecurity, we had um, tech savvy women and the power of the purse, super fun event. And we've had um, Hidden Figures, the Women in Aerospace of 2018, where we brought together young women, students, and our panel of experts, um, and it created just an amazing synergy um, within the young girls who are interested in engineering and who want to go into these careers for them to learn. But it was also a great opportunity for the ex experienced women to share their knowledge with these young women. So we have loved it and had a great time. Um, the other thing our Los Angeles chapter has done in the last couple of years is we were invited over to um, Cal Poly to talk to their students about um, their IT symposium about how to get a job, how to network, how to get on LinkedIn. You know, all those things we played games with them, exercises, talked, and our team had a great time. So what has Witty meant to me? So I've been a Witty member since 2004. I've been the regional network director of Witty LA since 2015. And the first event I ever went to in 2004, I found a mentor that is still a friend and a mentor to me today. So we're talking 14 years of mentorship, and I've had different mentors along the way. Witty has been a great support to me. It has helped me create personal leadership and growth for myself. I mean, I used to be terrified to get up on a stage and look at me now. The other thing is, I have twin daughters. They're 16 and a half years old. I've been a member of Witty since 2004, and it gives me a chance to give back and help them know that when they walk into whatever career they want to, they can be whoever they want to be. I'm helping them to, with Through Witty, help break that glass ceiling for whatever career you want to be in. I've also forged friendships and strong business relationships as a recruiter. I've helped people through Witty find jobs. I've met clients. It's been an amazing opportunity for me. So what can Witty do for you? So one of the things that we can do is we have resources, including our newsletter, articles, trends, webinars. Obviously, I talked about mentoring. I taught your networking here. OK, you can become a mentor or be, be a mentee. Um, we have our career center. As you guys all know, the career fair is going on right downstairs. These companies advertise. We have our virtual career fairs. It's a great chance for you to engage and help grow your career. We do STEM advocacy and have events around that. And then the other thing is, is that your personal brand. You can do speaking. You can do, you can do content on our newsletter. It's a great chance for you to help get your voice out there. Who wants their voice out there? Right? So um, throughout, through our Witty site, we maintain a platform of connections and resources and opportunities for our members. We offer two to four live webinars a month. Um, and you can view them as a Witty member even if you can't make the webinar. So you can do lunch and learn. You can go watch it at night after your kids go to bed. Whatever works for you, you can have access to that content. Um, so, and it's a lot, the whole library is available on the web. We also have special interest groups, cybersecurity, healthcare, medical, mobile, IoT, semiconductor, et cetera. So whatever your career is, we have a special place for you at Witty. So 
What will your support do for us? We're going to encourage young women and girls to choose business and tech careers. We're going to influence top leaders in government, academia, and industry to recognize purchasing power of women. Remember, we talked about tech-savvy women and the power of the purse. We're going to create a pipeline of women to fill these leadership roles. So how many of you young women want to be up here one day at the Witty Summit getting your um, induction into the Hall of Fame? Woo, right? So, and we're going to help transform media and corporate perception of women. So basically, we want, we put in place a dynamic program. And we want you to be part of Witty to help us achieve new heights in community engagement, can continue to support not only professional women, young women and girls as they continue to engage, learn and grow. Now, with many graduations and a lot of stuff going on with people's work and lots of event, life events, not all of our Witty networks um, are here today. But I want to ask, if you are affiliated with a Witty network or a Witty leader, can you please stand right now? And raise your hand high. Okay, there are people walking around with red badges that say Witty Network Leaders. If you want to find out about the Witty Networks in your neighborhoods and in your communities, please seek these ladies out and they will share it. Find me, I'm wearing white, I stand out, and I have a loud voice, and um, I will help you get that information um, if you, and get you cooked up with the right people. So. I really want to encourage you to reach out and become part of the Witty Networks. It's super important for you guys to continue to engage with us past just this summit. And I'm telling you that it has been the highlight of my career. So without further ado, we have a two minute video to share with you before our next speaker. So diversity to me um, is a big deal. And um, everybody and every opinion and everything you do is colored by the experiences you have. People think differently, so based on your socioeconomic background, based upon your gender, based upon um, different things, you bring all that experience in when you work. And I think that um, people who are different races, different socioeconomic background, and different genders all contribute and bring things to the table. If everybody thought the exact same way, why would we need to do something? Because we would know exactly what the bad actors were going to do. And I'll tell you, they don't sit there and go, wow, we can't have women in here. Or wow, we need more women in here. You know, women can be just as crafty as men can be. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Some of the people that I, I deal with, um, and right now I'm working with a group of folks on code protection. You know, how do we build things into our code? What are our threat models as we're looking at these solutions? What could somebody do and how do we put controls in to make sure it doesn't happen? And I'll say something, yes, but they can insert something in here which could cause this adverse reaction and people go, your mind is really sick. And I said, it's not sick. I'm looking for ways that I can break the system. I'm thinking outside the box. And these are the people that we need. We don't need people who, you know, group think. We need people who are going to bring those individual thoughts and that diversity in those various backgrounds to the table. We need young people and we need old people. If you want to, to um, experience something out of the box thinking, something that's not colored by policies, you bring in a young person. They have no background. They have no thoughts about, oh, I can't do this because the policy doesn't let me. I can't do this because of this reason. I want to understand the art of the possible. I don't want to understand, you know, no laws can be broken, physical or legal, but what is possible that can be done? And then we'll work it from there. But don't stop, oh, we can't do this because of policy. So diversity to me brings in those different kinds of thought patterns. And like it or not, females are still unfortunately sometimes raised differently and have different experiences than our male counterparts. And it's all good. It brings a different viewpoint to the table that could accidentally un you know, discover that big piece that is the aha moment that will let us understand what is going on.
So I am pleased to introduce our next speaker. She was inducted into the 23rd Annual Hall of Fame just last night and an inspiration to all of us. Please join me in welcoming Rhonda Childress. She is the IBM Fellow and Vice President of GTS Security Data and Privacy Officer as she talks about where have all the women in security gone. Please welcome Rhonda. Hopefully everybody's enjoying themselves and I need to apologize for my allergies. So if I have to stop and, and sniffle, I apologize or take a, a drink of water. I'm four Zyrtec into the day and it's only halfway through and I'm still having problems. Yes, and I'm standing upright. Apparently that's a, <laughs> a big thing that we do this. But um, I want to share with you some thoughts and some facts and, and a little story before we start. I worked for McDonnell Douglas, which was an aircraft manufacturer, and I was taken by a colleague to Bell Helicopter. And at the same site that they did the Bell Helicopters is they had the big cargo planes. And I was watching four males standing looking at the tracks in these cargo planes. And you could hear them going, well, maybe we need more, you know, less friction, more lubricant, and, you know, maybe bigger wheels and something like this. And as I'm listening to them, you know, and they, they're telling us that the problem is, is they're having problems with those big um, packages of cargo that they shove out the door, you know, when they're flying, the parachutes open and it comes down, that the wheels are getting stuck. Okay, so the wheels are getting stuck and they're trying to figure out, do they need bigger wheels, do they need more lubricant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the rule was, I was not supposed to say anything. Okay. And as I'm listening to them, 30 minutes talk about this. Finally, I just could not stand it anymore. And I said, have you guys ever thought about just cleaning out the tracks after you dump the stuff out so all the debris is out of the way and you don't and hit it with some WD-40 and call it a day? And they were like, wow, how simplistic. And now they have, you know, I am told that they have shop vacs mounted to the side of the airplane so they can vacuum out the tracks, you know, after they've done it and get the debris out of the way so the debris does not build up. And it's, it's that different viewpoint that we as women sometimes bring to the table that I want to talk about today and why it's so important. So as um, there's some statistics I'm going to share with you, but right now, currently in security, only 8 to 11 percent of the workforce are women. I mean, just think about that, 8 to 11 percent. Half of the graduates are women, but why are only 8 to 11 percent women going into security or cybersecurity. Currently, it takes about three months to fill an open position in cybersecurity. Think about that, three months. That's me as a manager looking for a qualified individual to fulfill that role, three months. Now, if we look at this, holy cow, did that feel right? Okay, so, <laughs> whoa, as we look at this, Look at that first block, one point, I think it's one, yeah, 1 1.8 million, 1.8 million unfulfilled roles are predicted to be in security by 2020. It's 2018, people. 2020 is two years from now, a year and a half, technically, if we want to be real specific, but 1.8 million of these, okay? Again, it takes more than three months right now to fill a role. So just think about that. And right now, if you look at this, what's happening right now, men are four times more likely than a female in security to have an executive or C-suite position. They are nine times more likely to have a managerial position, which as we all know, very much influences career track, career paths, and these kinds of things. So as we start looking at this, how are we going to start closing this gender divide in security? One of the big things I think that has helped is they quit calling it security and they've renamed it to cybersecurity. And I'm too old to remember to use the word cybersecurity, so I keep saying security, but cybersecurity. But if you look at this, as we look at it, you know, 
two-thirds of the high schoolers say they've never heard of cybersecurity when they're in high school. How many of you have heard of, or when you were in high school, had actually heard of the term security? You hear computer science, you hear programming, and all of this stuff, but you don't hear the word cybersecurity. How many of you heard, especially the younger people? So a few hands going up. So how do we get and influence these young ladies, our pipeline of the future, the people who have to bring that diverse thought to the table engaged in these kinds of things. And that's the conversation we want to have today. I'm really interested in your ideas and your thoughts and your opinions on how do we make this happen? Because if we don't, we will be shut out of some of the biggest jobs that we could potentially get. Especially considering there's gonna be 1.8 million unfulfilled jobs in a year and a half. Now, why would you say would there be 1.8 million unfulfilled jobs? Let's talk about that for a minute. Hackers, bad actors, sorry Diana, I used the word hacker, not bad actor, sorry. Press, over, you know, my, my media support over here, Diane Wave, there you go. Um, the bad actors are actually becoming more sophisticated in what they're doing. If you look at these things, Bitcoin's being stolen. Who'd ever heard of a Bitcoin before? Now anyway, right? Has, have any of you heard of the NotPetya attack that happened last year? NotPetya was an attack that was actually um, a hack of a supplier of software to several companies, an accounting software. So what happened was is the attackers did not go after the company, they went after the software supplier, broke into the supplier, changed the code without the supplier knowing the code had been changed. The code was then pushed out via a live update, as we all love and know our live updates of our software, right? Pushed out and then infected millions of computers. But not only did it infect it, but it encrypted the computer so that they could not be used. Now this was a great attack, and if you looked at it after we got a hold of it, we tore it apart and we looked at the sophistication. What it did is, how many systems administrators do we have in the room or people that do system administration work? So we have a few. What it did is it used WMI, and it used all the commands that we use in our system administration tools to manage our tools so we can get efficiencies of headcount. Well, I can have one person administering hundreds of servers, it used the same commands. Basically, it used what we used against ourselves. And it replicated and it spread throughout the networks. And then in another brilliant move, what it did was instead of encrypting all the file, it only encrypted the first part of the file that mattered, the first one megabyte. So it could be really fast and really efficient. And it spread like wildfire throughout. The current one that's happening, might be, you might know, it's called Meltdown Spectre. This is actually one where they're exploiting design flaws or design, try and see the right place, but it was deliberately designed, but they're, they're, they're exploiting the design of the, uh, the chips and the way the chips were manufactured. And what they're able to do is, is people thought that if I had VMware, if I had a container or I had a docker, I was safe. Now they're showing that that's no longer true. These current exploits that these guys are doing allows them to get in close to that silicon chip, undetected, keyword undetected, and then they can go almost anywhere on that computer system. Now if that's not scary, I don't know what is. But just think about it, you know, wouldn't that be really cool to have to track that down, though? To try to figure out what happened and why it happened and those kinds of things. So I look at myself like I like to solve mysteries. I cannot stand a mystery, and it makes my team nuts sometimes. I go, yes, but why is this little thing happening over here? There's something going on that's happening over here. So if you like to solve those mysteries and you like to do those things, I am telling you security is one of the greatest places to be to do that mystery solving kind of thing. And security has all kinds of job roles in it. We have managerial roles, we have seller roles, we have doer roles, and project roles. So as part of the security that I would encourage you guys to look at is these 
continuous roles that we have. So let's figure out what we need to do here. So again, when we look at these things, that diversity of thought is really what we need to bring to the table. As I said in the video, if we all thought the same, I would know exactly what they were going to do. I put a counter block in, they wouldn't do it. They would know that I was going to counter block, they would counter block, and we just counter block, counter block, counter block. But these guys are increasing in their sophistication. And they're starting to look at new ways to do the things that we wish they wouldn't do and those kinds of things. And so we've really got to start thinking about it. And um, in the video I had talked about one point, you know, where I say women can be just as crafty as men. And I had said, yes, and probably the reason you haven't heard of a female hacker is we're too damn good to get caught. <laughs> just think about it. You've heard of Mitnick and everything else. You've not heard of a big female hacker. But we are pretty good about cleaning up after ourselves, multitasking, you know, <laughs> and not leaving little trails around. So just think about that, you know, of what we do. But these are the things that I like to do and, and track these things down. But we've got to have that diversity. Everybody comes with a different background, I say. Everybody comes with a different set of education levels and whatever. And everything we've done throughout our lives and our careers colors what we do. And so if we do not have that thought process and have women at the table proactively contributing to this, you know, we are going to start having more and more issues where the group think and the mentality think is always going to be the same. Because sometimes it does take that woman stepping up saying, have you thought about just cleaning the tracks? And we don't need bigger wheels and we don't need more lubricant and these kinds of things. Additionally, you know, I would like to point out, there are these new collar jobs. Now, I know there's a lot of educators in the room, a lot of college grads, but not every job does require a college education. It can require some very specific education that we have to do, but we have to start thinking about some of this. You know, how are we going to close this 1.8 million job gap if I need everybody to go to four-year university and get an education? That's not to say that after you don't start your job, you shouldn't go get your education. But there are some roles that will let you start now in these $1.8 million job gaps that we have that will help us bring it up, right? And so you don't always have to have that kind, kind of role to do this. And we need to start educating students earlier. What is wrong with going into the elementary schools? and start teaching them about cybersecurity, sometimes in fun ways. Like, what kind of password do you use? Do you have, almost every elementary school child I have ever met to date has a phone. I don't know too many that do not have a phone. And one of the things we talk about to these young ladies are your security of your phone. Are you paying attention to what you're loading on your phone or your parents paying attention? Does it have access to your contacts list? Does it have access to your photos? Can it control your camera? You know, these are questions that we have to start educating our children about earlier. Don't download that freaking game on the internet and, and infect my network, which, by the way, my kids, we have a whole separate kid network. <laughs> then there's my network. <laughs> and then there's my husband's network. <laughs> you know, we try to keep it separate because my children were primo about handing out my Wi-Fi password like it was cotton candy. <laughs> Their friends would come over here, let me help you on the network. You know, and th the thing is 32 characters long, for Christ's sakes, and I can't type it in without a piece of paper, but by God, they can do it from memory like that. <laughs> and their friends are on the network and they're downloading things. And the first time my almost everything got infected on my network, I went, okay, who's downloading stuff? And then I learned to separate them off, those kinds of things. But we have to start teaching them things like not downloading things from the internet because it's convenient. They carry things with them. They carry things on their back. Free is not really free. But these kids don't know it because their friends are playing with the newest, greatest, you know, picture thing that pops up and it goes away really quickly. And, you know, all the kids are doing it, Mom, so we should be allowed to do it. And I'm like, no, give me your phone. 
kind of thing. And I, and I watch them pretty carefully. But the point is, is we've got to start educating these kids as we get them earlier and earlier because the dangers are there for them. So once we can start educating them, we can start teaching them about some of these things. And then bring them up into the girls who code, the coding camps, the fun things to do with these things. Unfortunately, I have not yet seen um, a summer program for cybersecurity. Diane, maybe we should think hard on that one, by the way. I've seen cyber days, one day out of 365 for it. But there is one? There is a summer camp. Awesome. You and I need to talk. So there is a summer, a summer camp, but I would like to see more of them, you know, taught. I would like to see secure coding practices taught in, the, in coding camps. How many um, of you have ever been to these camps? They don't talk word one about how to protect the app in these camps. They talk about the great and wonderful things you can do, which is awesome, to be honest with you but they don't talk about that. So we need to do this. So we need to be able to bring these young ladies together and bring them up into these cybersecurity type of environments so that they know what they're doing. Because you have to remember, women are the untapped resource for cybersecurity. If I don't leave you with anything else, women are the untapped resource for cybersecurity. And if we do not tap into that, we are going to not be able to keep up with the bad actors that we have at this point in time. So at this point in time, I'd like to open it up to questions. Oh, oh, right away, there's a question. <laughs> I, uh, do you want to go first or do you want her to go first? Go ahead. And please don't ask any GDPR questions. I'm so sick of that topic. <laughs> oh, no. My question is at my company, the cybersecurity and the security and fraud is all black boxed and all hidden and I'm more social than that. So how do you bridge that gut divide for women from the sort of cloud that's around those groups within large companies versus uh, the other more public play, uh, roles they can take? Um, I, I'm not a big believer in security through obfuscation, which would be potentially what that's called. I believe we have to talk about it. We do not have to be, you know, I don't have to be very um, specific about it, but we do have to talk about what are good coding practices. What are the secure engineering framework are you using? What risk methodology are you using? Those are okay conversations to have. You do not have to get into the specifics of those kinds of things. And, and you know, like ISACA and several of those organizations talk about it. NIST has some great frameworks. So I, I don't think that you should cloud it in mystery. That just makes it worse. And you're not helping other people when you do this. We run penetration tests on a lot of the applications that we do in global technology services. And we're very open with what we're finding. You know, we're not publishing on the internet. But we are open internally with this is what we're finding. These are the repeat offenders. These are the things that we're seeing you're not doing well. And if you're not transparent, at least internally, it's not going to get fixed. You know, and I even, I, some of these teams even want me to publish against teams to show how well they're doing so they can talk about how great they're doing. I've, I created a bunch of type A personality teams, apparently. <laughs> and they want to talk about, my pen test scores are better than your pen test scores. And sometimes that's a good thing to do, to create that healthy competition. But we can't surround security in, in a black shroud and keep it that way. We will not make a change and we will not make a difference if we do that. Hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question here. Oh. So, uh, the why? <laughs> I coach some millennials, and one of the questions they always ask me, and the concern they have is, all these hackers, people who work in security, are like super coders, like super intelligent, super logical people. And I don't want to compete there, so I'll choose something else. Application programming looks good, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. I've heard this so many times, and I don't really have a good answer for that. So I'll, I'll be honest with you those hackers are trained 
They, are, they did not hatch, and one day suddenly have the, ah, you know, super hacker skills. They, were lear they learned it and were trained by other people, okay? So you are always going to find somebody, I always do, that's brighter than you are. It's just the way it is, you know, and you learn from them. And so if, you know, right now, there is more money in cybersecurity than there is in application development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm a very monetarily driven woman, obviously. Obviously, you can tell my shirt says, don't hate, innovate. Uh -huh. So, you know, with patents and things like that, I do like my money for those kinds of things. So it's not really as much, to me, it's, it's more of a mindset of do you want to learn it? Yes. Okay, and let's remember, right or wrong, and, and when I was in university, people would say, how come you're so good at coding a computer when you have no clue and have never done this before? Mm -hmm. It's easy, I babysat. <laughs> I know for the computer, you have to sit down and give it step by step by step what to do. Just like watching and, and teaching a child, step by step by step, you have to do this. We're good at it. We're good at coding. We are good at security. We are good at multitasking. We are good at parking something in the back of our brain and letting it go and doing something else and all at once the issue will pop up and just ask my husband what happens about 2 a.m. Yes. I will wake up and grab a piece of paper and scribble an answer down and go back to sleep. And he's like, thank you very much. I'm now awake. <laughs> you know, so we, I now have a flashlight. I don't turn the light on anymore. I just have a flashlight. But, but we're good at that. So we make great folks in security with the hands-on type of situations. And I'll be honest with you, there is an international cybersecurity competition. I would love to see an all-female team win that one time. So if there's any university willing to do that, you know, we can get the coaches to help you because there would be nothing more kick-ass than an all-female team winning that cybersecurity competition. Wow. Thank you. I've got a quick one to your left. Left. Oh, marching band, eight years. Still don't have it down yet. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm a young female entrepreneur, and uh, my question is, um, several industries, you know, whether it be cybersecurity or something else, we talk about recruiting women. But what can we? What are your ideas about what can we do to develop and retain these women so that they don't actually leave? Develop and retain women so they don't actually. Leave. Well, that's a, a really good question. Um, I'll be honest with you. I can only go against the experiences that I have, um, and sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. Um, I had, you know, so like when I started out, I wasn't doing security. There was not a security field. We won't talk about how old I am, but you can sort of add up the numbers on the bio and figure it out. Um, it, was only, it was only computer science that they had, right? So it wasn't a specialty of that. Uh, and when I started interviewing, they would ask things like, well, are you going to marry and just quit? When are you going to go off and have babies? I'm like, I'm not even dating. What the heck is going on here? Um, kind of thing. But I will tell you, my first aha moment with how we retain these things was when I became pregnant with my first son. Alan Westine, who um, I cannot speak more highly of, a, a man, was, was my vice president at the time. And he came to me and he said, whatever you do, please, for God's sakes, come back. <laughs> and he said, if I have to run a T1 line to your house, which, by the way, back then was a massively big deal, a T1 line to your house so you will work at home, and you want to take care of your children, that's what I will do. Whatever it takes for you to come back. And it's that kind of commitment that tells you that you're appreciated. And it's, it's the, the men and the women within IBM who have, and you guys met my loud tribe last night who left um, last night, but it, it's, it's everybody who has, has pushed me along saying, Rhonda, you're good enough, you can do this. Because even I have self-doubts, to be honest with you. I wasn't going to apply for this award until several people went smack, smack, poke, poke, fill out the paperwork kind of thing. Because I never figured I'm, I'm good enough. Because it's, it's the way. But it's that constant, you're good enough. 
You're the team lead. I was the team lead of 20 men, only female. 20 men, only female. We are good enough. So for them to retain us, they have to, to remember, you know, don't ask us, are we leaving to go take care of our children when you leave every day to go golf? <laughs> oh my God, you know? And I actually had an incident one time where my husband was working in Texas and we were living in Missouri at the time. And um, one of the, my manager was like, I had to leave, had to pick the kids up from daycare. Daycare imposes fines if you don't pick them up on time. A dollar a minute, yeah, a dollar a minute. Yeah, I think it was five when I was doing it. Boy, they come down, excellent. <laughs> and it was five per child, and there was two of them, so $10 for every minute you're late. They're, they're racking up. So I'm racing to get there, and he goes, where are you going? I go, I gotta go pick these up, the kids up. Your husband's not here, no one else is gonna do this, right? And he sort of gave me a lecture. And I was caught between, do I turn them into HR? What do I do? Next day, HR's at my door knocking. Five people had turned them in. Five people. And that's the kind of company you want to work for that will not tolerate that kind of stuff. That's how you keep women by knowing they should be allowed the same leeway as anybody else. And when you've got to go take care of your kids, you've got to go take care of your kids. It's just the way it is. Be you a man, be you a woman. It doesn't matter. So if you can, you can keep women, if you've got a good family-oriented opportunities, you've got the leeway to take care of them like you should, you know, then the rest will come to me. That's how we keep women. Because these are the things we value, or at least I value. Hopefully that helps. Okay, go over there. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Rhonda. This is Teresa Martin from IBM. And my question, I'm hoping that you know, um, your question was on how do you retain or get more women into that field? In IBM, there are all these different networks that mm -hmm. reach out to women. Are they not going to the high school, the colleges, during graduation, during summer breaks, and trying to recruit for an uh, internship? Wouldn't that be a step towards that? That is, that is one step, but it's not enough. We do Girls Who Code, and I think for the last several years, we've done it at four locations. Mm -hmm. We go to the high schools. We do cybersecurity days. We do cybersecurity weeks sometimes. We're present at the bring your children to work kind of thing, and it's all there. But these are point in time situations, and I don't think they're long term enough. Okay. So somehow we've got to get the thought process that it's okay to be in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. I think part of the challenge is, is that what used to be always called security. And when you look at it, parents think about security guns and these kinds of things. And, and this is just my thought. No one else has coached me on this or anything. But it, it's sort of scary when you think about it. And they have to realize that, you know, we're, we're sitting there and we're sort of doing battle not with guns, but with wits and our brains and our skills and what we can pull out of our pockets and what we can think to do. So, you know, sometimes the security, when you hear it, you know, when my mom first heard my son was going into security, he, she went, <gasps> I, Mom, there's no guns involved. It's okay. <laughs> this, is, this is a battle of the wits, not a battle of the guns kind of thing, right? So I, I think some of that colors it also. It's not a field that's often thought of. When you, when you think about computer science, cybersecurity is not one of those fields that a lot of people think about. But they're starting to because of, of the things like NotPetya and Meltdown Spectre and these kinds of, of attacks that are coming along. Because the hackers are getting increasingly more sophisticated. And they're getting good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Rhonda. This is Radhika from Dubnova Group. Um, just an observation, I think, and since we have such a great captive audience, um, you mentioned the need for women to get into cybersecurity. Um, the way to leapfrog uh, cybersecurity is by way of blockchain. Um, a lot of the issues we have with centralized systems is that there is a single point of failure. And so the hackers, once they get into, or the bad actors, as you said, um, once they get into these centralized systems is that they have keys to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So when you have a decentralized system, such as in blockchain, you have the ability to, to mitigate some of those risks that we have in cybersecurity. And so what I want to basically advocate, and I, I'm actually involved in many of the women in blockchain groups, um, 
I'd love to see more women get into blockchain because I think the answer to a lot of the cybersecurity risks that we have today is by way of blockchain technology. So great opportunities for women to get involved at the ground floor level in a very, very fast growth area. Very lucrative, by the way. And it is truly a battle of the wits. Um, yep. There's basis in cryptography here. So those of you that are really excited about math, it's an amazing field to get into. Um, actually running a hackathon this next weekend in San Francisco. So for those of you women developers that want to get involved and learn about um, cybersecurity as a part of it, um, actually IBM is our sponsor. So we're actually featuring Hyperledger Fabric. Um, and we're going to have a great talk by one of the distinguished IBM fellows from IBM uh, in, uh, presenting. Mm -hmm. So if you want to learn more, get involved in, the, in, the, in these kinds of endeavors. But I think that the idea of uh, finding a new way to do yeah. something, uh, leapfrogging the kind of yeah, issues yeah. that we have, I think that you're probably in agreement with that. And I think blockchain is, uh, offers a tremendous future. It, it is. And, and blockchain, I think part of it was developed for to to circumvent some of the things that Correct. we're seeing. Yeah. And and that's another great way to get involved Super. is by understanding what's going on and then say, okay, I don't want to do this in the traditional way. I, you know, we call that tipping the box upside down yeah. or tipping the, the pyramid upside down. And I get in trouble for that quite a lot or calling outside the box. But it's, you know, why do we have to look at it that way all the time? Yeah. So if you like to think about things differently, there's another great opportunity for you to look at that blockchain or what the next big thing might be that dis is disruptive. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Rhonda. Uh, I'm Nadia from Amadeus. Uh, great meeting you here. A lot of very passionate information yeah. that you've been sharing with us. I'm a security engineer, but well, used to be. Um, no, but I've moved to a different architect position, uh -huh. which is which covers the broader term. So mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm, new, I'm excited about this role. Um, however, security is you know, part of my yeah. role. Of course, there's no, no solution designed without security, right? Um, what I'm lacking right now is uh, security is my passion, and I want to you know, keep, stay updated with what's happening mm -hmm. in this field. Um, but I don't know where to go to because there are coding games, hackathons, all those things. I try to participate in them, but they are very focused on specific technologies, yeah, not on security. Um, I still try to keep in touch with my previous team mm -hmm. to see what are the new dif new things that they are working on. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, you know, that's. I don't want to go to them like every week and ask them for, hey, what are you doing to today? You know, this week. Yeah, Instead. Yeah. <laughs> I I, uh, I want to uh, find forums or groups which I've been looking for mm -hmm. on LinkedIn or Facebook, but there's a lot of trash out there, yeah. which is, I want to see like people like you, leaders who have mm -hmm. vision, mm -hmm. where are you guys, where are you guys located on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and for that answer, Diane's gonna speak. <laughs> if we, could you get up and go over to my, Right. There, there's Thank also you. other groups. Uh, ISACA has some information. Um, there are other groups like that out there that has information. Um, IBM does some threat intelligence. So there, there actually is a lot of information out there. Caleb Barlow, who's one of our vice presidents, actually puts out a weekly blog and talks about things um, that you can do. Unfortunately, the stuff that he covers already happens to me. So he talks about like your credit card getting hacked. And of course, mine got like three times. <laughs> Not my fault. As the first, my husband has actually gotten a separate credit card because he's like, I don't understand. As president of data security, your credit card gets hacked. I'm like, look, it's not me doing it. So, <sighs> oh my God. He acts like it's me deliberately trying to just tweak my nose at him. But there are, there are a lot of resources. Why don't you come see me? We'll sit down and troll through the internet and I'll help you find some that hopefully one will be a great fit for you. Sure. Okay? Thank you very much. Anyone else? I don't know about how we're doing on time. We're done? Oh, darn. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Melissa Jerkoys. I'm here representing Witty Boston with a few of my Boston teammates here as well. Really excited. This is my first summit. It's been awesome. Um, so I wanted to thank Rhonda. This has been awesome and great. And 
I, I'm sure everyone here is really, really uh, motivated and wanting to know like what to do next. So I had a ton of questions, but everyone kind of stole mine. So <laughs> I'm going to ask one final parting question of you. If you could address everyone in the audience that's really inspired by you and some of the other amazing female leaders here mm -hmm. this, this week. What is their call to action? What can they do to help? So, you know, women is a underutilized resource in security and other technology fields, as we well know. What can each of us do? There's a couple of things to do. One, um, personally, you know, investigate what you're doing. Make sure that you've got good passwords. You separate your financial emails from, say, your personal emails. How many people do that kind of stuff? Other than me. I'm good. <laughs> But, but, you know, take a look at some of your personal things. And then stop to look and think, is security one of these areas I want to go, get into? There are a couple of, of online universities that do have some free classes, the free word, okay, that you can take a look to see if this is something you want to do. And remember, in security, there are a lot of different jobs that you can do. You don't have to be the one banging on the router trying to keep the bad guy out. If you like to solve mysteries, trying to figure out, our, like our x -Force Iris team, who goes in and tries to figure out how did the person get in? What did they do? What did they take? What could have been taken from us? Those kind of things. So if you like to solve mysteries, that's a really good way to go. But there are some free um, classes out there that I would suggest that you take. You know, no investment except time for yourself to do this, to see what it is. And also, you know, when you're speaking to young ladies, mention cybersecurity is a very growing 1.8 million jobs by 2020 will go unfulfilled if we don't start getting a pipeline of women in security. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, Rhonda.